Welcome to the season finale of Educational Assessment with Professor Denoboli. I'm your host, Michael Denoboli, and this episode is Artificial Intelligence in Education and Assessment, um, subtext, chat GPT. Uh, there is no official slides for this particular uh, session. Uh, I did want to just show you briefly some really cool things with chat GPT. Um, like many educators, when news broke earlier this year about chat GPT, even though chat GPT has actually been around since 2020, uh, it started making headlines early 2023 um, because of its educational implications, namely dealing with academic integrity. And there's a lot of discussion right now about chat GPT and, and how it should be used in education because, uh, I mean, I'll just give you an example. Um, and, and I hate that they do this on the commercials for chat GPT. If you ever see them on, on different social media and stuff like that, I'm like, why are you showing people that this is what chat GPT can do? But if you wanted to ask it something to the effect of, uh, can you write me a 1700 word essay on, uh, what do I have here? On uh, moonshine uh, peanut brittle. Um, and its origins. I, my, my sister and brother-in-law and my nieces, they went out to Tennessee a couple of weeks ago. They brought me back uh, moonshine peanut brittle from Tennessee. And here it's going to generate for me a 1700 word essay about moonshine peanut brittle and its origins. And um, here it's going into the whole history of moonshine, <laughs> things like that. Um, this is truly amazing in terms of technology, but it has a lot of implications for education. As you can tell, as far as academic integrity goes, the problem is that if a student submits this, um, it's not going to be detected on traditional um, uh, plagiarism software. Uh, it's it's not going to come up because it's technically original. ChatGPT just created this. Now, if I exit again, can you write me another 1700 word essay on moonshine peanut brittle and its origins? It's going to come up with a totally different essay with the same information but it's going to be a quote unquote it says it doesn't come up with original work but it's original in the sense of that it's not going to use the same words so here's the issue that i have from that before i get to like the awesome stuff that it can do so this this leaves us with a lot of of questions regarding education Google has already said, like, it's going to be out of a job within a year or two uh, because I've already started doing this. As you can see over here, like, I was, I wanted to know about the first rock and roll song. I Googled it. it re Google didn't really come up with anything for me. Chat GPT gave me a little bit of more information. I could go to Wikipedia, but I don't know if Wikipedia is right. Now is... Is chat GPT 100%? If you go to the new chat, it'll let you know the limitations. It may occasionally generate incorrect information. It may occasionally produce harmful instructions or biased content. It may uh, it has limited knowledge of the world and events after 2021. So uh, it's still learning stuff. So because of that, it may not be 100%. So if you're looking for news, with if you're going to ask ChatGPT about something that happened within the last two years, it's going to be choppy because that information hasn't been interacted into its database as of yet. With that said, uh, and that's why it's important that when you are using it, that you really uh, question uh, you really question chat GPT with the, with the right questions. And like, 
in reality, what's cool about ChatGPT is that you could really get really rich information if you know the right questions to ask. Uh, and so uh, the the bottom line is that um, you really need to to be careful of what you're of what you're getting off of ChatGPT. But I can tell you, I've already used ChatGPT to help me, you know, prep some of my lessons. Now, I haven't asked it to prep a lesson for me in that traditional sense, but it'll help me prep different parts of my lesson. So, for example, if I want to come up with a really good um, energizer or do now at the beginning of my lesson, I can come to ChatGPT and ask it, like, for example, I'm going to be I'm going to be planning lessons later today. And it's going to be about um, uh, our town. Uh, can you? Uh, I like doing it this way because it it it. Can I ask you questions about the play, our town? And it's going to say, you know, of course I can help you with questions about our town. But by doing that, by asking that initial question, can I ask you questions about this? I don't have to say the word our town now until um, I bring up something else. So now every question I say before this, it's going to be within the realm of our town. Uh, can you give me some energizer um, activities to give students? I need to make sure that I'm spelling uh, not activities to give students really there we go to give students it's sunday uh to give students um before they start reading the play i don't i don't have to put our time because it's already there and i put a period but certainly here are a few energizer activities three truths and a lie have each student come up with three true statements and one false statement about themselves the rest of the class must guess which statement is true hot seats choose one student so these are really good interactive activities that now as i'm planning my lesson i can really and so here i'm using chat gpt not as to do the work for me i'm allowing it to be a resource so that i'm working smarter not harder i could go to google and i could start googling all of this but I can get lost in the Google um, wormhole. I mean, there are times I was looking for something for lesson plans, and I'm there for one, two, three hours looking for one thing. And then something comes up, and I'm like, oh, here's a YouTube video. I'm going to watch this YouTube video. And then like five YouTube videos later, which is actually four hours later, you know, I just lost so much time and productivity. So... Now here, this is, now let's say I want to do speed dating, all right? Set up a series of two-minute rounds where students pair up and take turns answering questions from a list you've prepared. After each round, students switch partners and repeat the process with a new question. So let's say, uh, can you provide me with some uh, sample questions? for the Our Town Energizer using the speeding, speed dating protocol. And it's gonna tell me, certainly here are some sample questions to use for the speed dating energizer activity. It's gonna give me a series of questions. I've already done this for um, like a, a privilege walk that I did in preparation for um, reading uh, Trifles. So it was a feminist privilege walk to, to really get students uh, into the idea of feminism and looking at, um, you know, genderized privilege. Why was that important? Because at the end of the gender walk, the kids found out that all the guys were all the way up front while the girls were all the way in the back. And the questions were things like, who has ever been catcalled? Uh, who has never been catcalled on the, on the street? Most of the guys, all the guys stepped forward. 
and not all the girls step forward. Uh, you know, uh, who has never been questioned uh, about their um, ability to do something because of their gender. All right. And the students ended up where they ended up. But it was really interesting that by the end of the, the walk, all the guys were a couple of paces ahead of the girls. And the whole point of the the uh, privilege walk was to show um, how we don't necessarily live in a world where men and women have the same exact experiences uh, all the time. And in many cases, those experiences affect the way we think and feel and interact with the world around us. And so... I was able to put that together using chat GPT as that source of building those, those questions for the privilege walk. Could I have come up with them on my own? It would have taken me a whole lot longer than it actually did. But the bottom line for me is the fact that I still have to choose what things I want to use. There's no difference here than I feel uh, than taking a textbook and modifying work in a textbook in order to teach your lesson or getting a prefab lesson off of line from Teachers Pay Teachers or from a website like Prestwick House or Scholastic and modifying it for the purposes of my classroom. Because especially since the, uh, ChatGPT isn't always going to um, spit out what I want it to spit out. So, for example, uh, when I was reading Anthem by Ayn Rand with them a couple of weeks ago, um, I asked ChatGPT, can you come up with a series of questions within um, uh, to comparatively analyze uh, Anthem with Plato's The Cave um, for chapters uh, six through eight? And it was generating questions, not from chapters six through eight, but from the whole novel. So I had to go back and say, can you focus on chapter six? Can you focus on chapter seven? Like I had to find ways to figure out, to generate what I needed it to generate. And I feel that's the reason why it's not really like I'm working smarter, not harder in that sense, because I'm generating very high level questions, but I need to know my stuff because if I didn't know that it was generating it for the entire novel and not for the chapters that I wanted to do, I'm going to go into class the next day and the kids aren't going to know um, what what's going on. So here it generated for me 10 questions. Now, if this is an energizer and they're going to be going around in groups and in groups of two to three, most likely 10 questions isn't going to be feasible. This is this will probably work better as a uh like if I want to do a background on our town. Um uh this maybe work better as like the day one activity if I wanted to go down that road. But here are some of the questions that it generated. If you could live in any decade from the past, which one uh would you choose and why? That's really great for the students to to really think about because our town is about small town American life in in 1900 in turn of the century it takes place like late 1800s early 1900s um and so that's a really good question that I would want them to contemplate uh what are your thoughts on small town life being that they're in the South Bronx in New York City that might be a really good thing to to get their 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 thought processes going. Uh, what do you think the play Our Town is about? Like, I don't like that question, so I'm not going to use that question. So ChatGPT spit out all these questions, but um, I'm not going to. I'm not necessarily going to use all the questions as is because I know what I want to teach for the lesson. Uh, that I'm going for. Um, let's say, you know, uh, can you provide me some uh, background information on the playwright of our town? 
So Thornton Wilder is an American playwright and novelist who was born in April on April 17th, 1897 in Madison, Wisconsin, and died on December 7th, 1975 in Hamden, Connecticut. And it goes through all of this, and, and then it, it ends up with uh, Our Town being his most famous play. Okay, this is great. I may not use all of this, and I may want to. I mean, I know a little bit about Thornton Wilder because I've taught this play over and over and over again. Uh, I may want to like double check some of this information, but based off of what I know, this for the most part looks looks a hundred percent on the up and up. Um, maybe some of the years are off. I doubt that they're off. Um, but usually, this type of stuff is is pretty straightforward. It's kind of like when you go on Google. Um, uh, you, you're not really going to find the information going to be completely off. It, you'll know when it's completely off because when you ask the question, it didn't give you the answer that it want you wanted it to give you. So you had to rephrase the question, uh, in in such a way. I don't know if I can come up with a uh with a, with an example of that. Um, but uh, so. What would be another um, another thing that we can do? So, uh, uh, what are some activities I can do with my students to help them better understand the themes and philosophies of our town why do i like to teach our town because it's an existential play it's a play about yes it's about small town life in america but it's more than just about small town life in america it's a play about what does it mean to be human and that's that's what i like about it so i've taught this play many different times and i can teach it the same way again but it's like, I'm coming here to chat GPT just to get some interesting ideas. Maybe there's something different that I can do. So here's what it here's what it's saying. It's offering the reflection journal, okay? Um, I've tried reflection journals in the past. It's very difficult to get students to really get into them. You really have to start it at the beginning of the year. I'm at the end of the year, so I don't I don't know if I'm gonna want to do that. A town hall meeting, I may like to do that. Even though it's like, even though a town hall meeting may not necessarily be standards based, I would want my meeting to be aligned with my standards. Again, going back to those standard based assessment uh, protocols and practices. So, a town hall meeting may be great in order to get them into the mindset of this is what our town is about. Uh, how, go, like, this is about going out in the middle of nowhere and establishing a town. And I may I may share with them if I wanted to do that as as one of my lessons uh, to do a town hall meeting. Um, I may use the the um, I may do this after the fact. I may do a town hall meeting. So here's an example of, of what I may do after we read the play. And in order to assess them, do they understand the themes of the play? I may set up a town hall meeting. My energizer that day may be, um, you know, watching a clip from uh, the movie Cars, because I mean, who doesn't like Cars? So they they watch a scene, uh, um, uh, one of the scenes from the music Cars, um, probably one of my favorite songs from the movie Cars, which was was which I think it was called uh this is our town or something like that um and then the activity for the day which will be the assessment i would create a list of topics related to the themes of the play and we would have a town hall meeting structure format where the students have to discuss the play as the town hall meeting I've never done that before, but I mean, I wouldn't have thought about it if I didn't plug it in here in, in chat GPT, uh, mapping Grover's corners. Uh, I don't know if I really want to do that. Like, I really don't care about their understanding of, of geography. Maybe it'll help them better understand the play, 
But I don't know if I want to spend time on that. If I was teaching this play in middle school, maybe. Excuse me, maybe. But p teaching it as part of a college course, I don't know if I want to spend a day on, on doing a map of Grover's Cl Corners. Uh, a modern day Our Town. Ask students to imagine how Our Town would be different if it were set in present day. Have them consider how technology, social media, and other aspects of contemporary life might affect the place, themes, and messages. I love that. I may do that. That may be something great to do with them because it really engages them on, you know, if we if this was to be rewritten now, uh, like, did, did it tell me when it was published? Uh, it, it premiered in 1938. Uh, when was Our Town written? And when is it set? So it was written in 1938, and it's set in the early 20th century, 1901 uh, to 1913. So the play is set from 1901 to 1913. So, you know, if we were to write Our Town 2 100 years later, how would it look different? Like, look, I, I, the, I think that would be a really cool activity. That may be a creative activity to do after the fact, but I'm hitting my standards because they have to understand how uh, our town is in order to put that modern day our town together. Now, the point is, is this. I let my students know up front, guys, I know you could plug it in and you could just say, can you write me a modern day hour town? And it'll do it. It'll give you an, it, it, I, and is some of it's not that bad, uh, which is, that's the scary part of it. It really isn't that bad of what it generates. Um, but uh, for, for me, I really, this particular semester, um, I really wanted my students to see, I, I didn't want them to, to come to think that, I was pretending that this didn't exist because if I pretended that this didn't exist, they were going to use it behind my back. But because I told them that it existed. Now, there are things online where you can see if things are computer generated, but it's really difficult to really get to 100 percent to measure it out. The thing is, I told my students on day one, guys, look, um, I know you're writing. Some of you I've taught for years. So if all of a sudden you're coming in and then. It, it, you know, your your work is all of a sudden like all grammatically correct and it's all like all of a sudden I'm going to start questioning where you got it from. Um, and I may not be able to find it online, but if I compare it to old things you wrote for me, most likely it's going to come up that uh, what you wrote here wasn't original. Um. Also, and here's something to let you guys know as you go further in your educational career uh, and also your college career, your academic career, what I also like is, like, let's say now I want them to write an essay on our town. Um, what are some of the ways that I can use critical theory to analyze our town? So now... You know, here are some critical theories that I could use to analyze our town. And it's going to list me the different theories. Feminist theory, Marxist theory, psychoanalytic theory. What else is it going to give me? Read a response theory. Um, Post-colonial theory. And here's the thing. Now, I have a starting point that I can use, like... Maybe I, I don't do post-colonial because the teacher really didn't touch post-colonial this semester. But I really got, you know, I really got feminist theory. I got feminist theory down. And this gives me a starting point that I can use. All right. So let's say I want to do a feminist critique of our town. And now I'm going to go down here and say, can you find me some peer-reviewed sources that I can use to analyze our town from a feminist perspective. All right. And now it's going to generate me this list of critical sources. 
Now, some of my students have done this and they've been, ha they've been having difficulty finding these sources. Some of it may be because um, they're not going on to a, and logging into a library. That's a whole nother discussion. But the point is this. I now have five sources here that can help me in analyzing our town uh, from a feminist uh, perspective. Um, I could have spent, I could have gone to the library and this could have taken me about an hour to find out, but ChatGPT brought it up for me uh, in less than a minute. Now, why? Here's my argument. Why is this not plagiarism or anything like that? Because I can now go to these sources and now I have to, you know, I have to interact with these sources and I have to get the information out of it. ChatGPT just helped me save uh, an hour or two that I could have spent looking for it in a library because now I can go to the library and look specifically for these articles. Um, I, I don't know how that's plagiarism. I, I think that's working smarter, not harder. Um, I let my students know this is where you can start. Here's where the, the line gets fuzzy because now um, you can uh, really, you can now ask it, can you write the essay for me? And it can write the essay and now you can go back and you can, you can just plug in. Or That's when you start getting into uh, um that's really when you start getting into uh, the gray area of plagiarism. When you're starting to ask ChatGPT to do the work for you, instead of it being a partner in crime, so to speak, where it's helping you, it's helping you do the grunt work that would normally take you hours to do, and it's only make it's only taking a few minutes to do it. Um, now, now here's the thing. Now here, it's given to me, that's in um, APA format. I know it's APA format because uh, I, I've i done this. Uh, can you give me the sources that you just shared with me in MLA format? And so now it's going to give me the sources in MLA format. And... I now have a preliminary uh, work cited page in MLA format. You know, um, so it's going to go through that. I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, what would be, uh, can you give me the sources in another research? Uh, can't think of uh it's gonna go back to APA. Uh let me stop generating it. Um can we give them in another format other than APA? Let's see. Chicago manual. That's what I was looking for. Chicago, Chicago style. So now it's gonna give me it in Chicago style if I, if my professor wanted it uh in Chicago style. Um and so the whole point is this. Uh, now, I may want to double check with like Owl Purdue or, or another website to make sure that these sources are the way that they are. But the point here is this. I'm not I've done nothing of plagiarism as of yet, because all I've been using ChatGPT for is really to assist me as a resource. I haven't used ChatGPT to do the actual work for me. Um even we could say borderline here, even here. You know, when I asked it, what are some ideas? Well, what's the difference between asking ChatGPT or sitting down with your teacher and asking your teacher, what are different ways that you could analyze uh, the text through the different lenses? And the teacher sits down and says, here's A, B, C, D. Here are different ways that you could go about it. You still have to write the paper. So that's why it's not plagiarism. You still have to do the grunt work. Uh, in that sense, the difference is, is that you can get to the grunt work more quickly by asking ChatGPT to help you uh, than, than not having ChatGPT help you. Uh, 
it, it, the fact that it's assisting you in getting from point A to point B, and then you have to get to point C on your own. That's what I like about chat GPT. Uh, if we're going to use, it, it's kind of like, you know, when the, um, when the mechanical harvester first came out, uh, the mechanical harvester did the job of, of a hundred, a uh, hundred um, field hands. And it devastated the market the of employees because you had thousands and thousands and thousands of field hands who were now out of a job. The thing is, is that somebody still had to operate the mechanical harvester. So I think here, um, it's not so much about about worrying about oh my god he this this artificial intelligence is going to take over the world it's more in the sense of how can we take this advancement in technology and assist us in doing the things that took us so long to do beforehand uh and make it quicker the problem and here's where the gray area comes without it doing the thinking for us because oftentimes what happens with the technology is that we take the shortcut and we allow it to do the thinking for us. And that's where we get problems because when we allow the when we allow technology to do the thinking for us, um, when we don't have access to that technology and we basically have evolved ourselves out of that particular part of the human uh, experience, then that causes problems because um, then we've become so reliant on that technology. Um, have any of you ever, like, whenever you've worked you've worked on your cell phones, you know, you're, you're playing on your cell phone, playing on your cell phone, and then the cell tower goes out, and you're like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And we forgot there was a time before we had cell phones. It's It's kind of like that. But the problem here is that when we're talking about critical thinking, if we allow the artificial intelligence to do the thinking for us, that's the problem. If we're having the technology to assist us in doing the small things that used to take us hours to do, and now it can help us do it in mere minutes, I don't see a, a, an issue with that. Some people do. Me personally, I don't. Um, that was just a little bit on on AI in in education and assessment. Um, the other thing, as I was as we were saying before, to help you with generating it for assessment, uh, you can you can ask it to generate some some types of. Uh, so just to give you an example, can you give me some um, high rigor multiple choice questions about the play. Um, and so it's going to generate some questions for me. But now I have a choice now of what questions I want to do. Um, I wonder uh can you write these questions in alignment with new york state next generation standards and the ela agents exam i'm curious if we can do that This is amazing. Oh, and it's giving me the standards. Oh my God, look at that. That is awesome. I've never asked it to do something like this. I've, this is, see, now I'm nerding out. I'm nerding out because this is awesome. This is great. Remember how I said before, <coughs> every question needs to be aligned with a standard. Now, if I wanted to give this, let's just say these were, these were 10th graders, and I wanted to give them uh, this. This was a five question pop quiz. I can now test them on whether or not they, they're aligned with the standards. This is amazing. This is a game changer, in, in my opinion, in terms of technology and education and assessment. 
with with uh what well, what was it with uh Spider Man? Uh, with with great power comes great responsibility. It's the same thing with technology. Uh, we can't allow technology to run away with the responsibility of of who we are as educators. Um, does this make our job less relevant in certain ways yes just just like the internet did for us it 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 what this is going to do in the coming years just as the internet did we're we've moved we're, we have to move away from a model of education where teachers are the gatekeepers of knowledge. We're no longer the gatekeepers of knowledge because a kid can go online and they, they can teach themselves. They can go on YouTube. I was watching a documentary uh, this weekend called Higher, uh, High Score about video games. Nintendo had um, game counselors. They, they hired kids uh, to play the games. Uh, by kids, I mean like late teenagers and young adults. Um, they would, they would hire them to play the games, uh, and then people would call in and, uh, they would ask them how to beat a level of a game. YouTube, that's what YouTube now, now is. So you don't have Nintendo counselors anymore because your Nintendo counselors are on YouTube. So in essence, that's, that, that's what it's, it, it, Chat GPT and artificial intelligence is going to force the educational field into a space where it needs to reflect on what is the purpose of education. And the purpose of education is not to impart knowledge. It's not to simply prepare students for a job because they don't need you to do that. They don't need me to teach them how to prepare for a job. They could look that up online if they really wanted to. Uh, and in some cases, just like you guys are doing here, you could do a whole program online. Uh, my job here wasn't to impart knowledge on you in this entire course. Uh, I had to guide you in where you could find the information. And that is where education is going to go in the coming decades. Um, probably did this a lot longer than I expected to do it. Uh, I got really excited about this little feature right here. I, I, I didn't even know that this was possible. This is awesome. Um, with that said, uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate your time in the course with me. Um, and I really hope I get to, to see all of you in the future uh, in whatever capacity. Um, and... Uh, if if you have the opportunity of taking another class with me in the future, I'd I'd be honored. Uh, thank you all. Um, have a good rest of your semester. Uh, and let's 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 finish this as we started. Let let's finish off strong. Um, and I look forward to seeing you on, um, on the group me chat. Uh, talk to you soon.